Great, so I can still see the numbers going up a little bit. So just giving folks a few minutes more to come in, but thank you all for, for joining promptly for those of you that have. Great. Well, I think what we'll do is we'll we'll make a start to acknowledge all of you that have have joined on time. So hello, everybody. Um, my name is Mary Kernahan, and I'm delighted to welcome you all today to this webinar brought to you by Abian. Uh, today, we're going to see what impact bad actors and counterfeit products have on the online marketplace and landscape. We're going to explore the benefits of adopting a comprehensive online brand protection strategy. And we're going to highlight some of the practical ways to detect and tackle infringements effectively. But before we do, I'm going to turn the cards a little bit round um, and invite you to participate in answering a question or two. So we've got a poll, which um, hopefully you'll, you'll see now. And there are two questions. The first is, in your view, what is the greatest online brand threat your brand is facing right now? Is it fraudulent domains, illicit sellers and listings on marketplaces, imposter accounts on social media, fake apps, or all of the above? So hopefully we'll get the answers coming in for that. I appreciate there are lots of other brand threats as well, but these highlight some of the, the key ones that are flying around at the moment. And I guess with fraudulent domains, we, we're also sort of perhaps inferring their um, websites as well, um, and illicit content on independent websites. Um, and indeed, it seems to be fraudulent domains and websites seems to be that the coming in at 36%. So that that's quite a high one. And then marketplace infringements, clearly, um, that that's currently sitting at 30%. Um, fake apps for some folks that doesn't enter the picture at all but clearly for some of you today that is a concern and then social media with imposter accounts as well um, and interestingly 17 percent of you are saying that all of these are issues of concern so hopefully we'll, we'll touch on those as the webinar goes on before we go on to that second question budgeting um, second question is where does online brand protection sit in your budgeting priorities is it a priority and come what may you're going to find a budget for it or do you need to be convinced that this is a valuable spend of resource oh so i've got some work to do oh gosh a lot of you need to be convinced okay well that's that's got me and my my work cut out for this for the next half an hour or so um okay so 57 percent of you are saying that you come what may you'll find the budget and 41 percent need to be convinced okay right or oh, slight change of numbers going up so 60 40 okay right well thank you for that thank you for participating that's great i'm now going to share my screen um so hopefully what you will see is the presentation and if I can get that into presentation mode, all being well, um, that, that will be very straightforward. So I, I'm Mary Kernahan, as I, I said at the beginning, and I know from years of experience in the industry that the best online brand protection uses a combination of innovative and continually developing technology and a fantastic dedicated expert team to find and eliminate brand abuse on the world's busiest online channels. So online brand protection, perhaps for all of us, is needed more than ever. And our curiosity and our determination and our passion leads us to work continually to stay ahead as bad actors evolve their strategies and to support a safe and open marketplace. What we want to ensure is that innovation is rightly rewarded that IPRs are enforced, that customers are protected, and that as businesses, you can all flourish. From the consumer perspective, though, the consumer often fears there's an urgency for things. They want things quickly. Sometimes there's unfamiliarity with where the consumer is, what the consumer is buying or maybe where they're buying from. And there may be a fear of missing out as well on a bargain. And all of this can drive the unassuming consumer 
to buy a fake or to part with their money or personal details sometimes on fraudulent websites. And this has serious economic ramifications for a business. And we want to make sure through this webinar, but actually more beyond the webinar, um, that you're prepared to protect your customers and to protect your brand reputation and ultimately your revenue streams. And many of you may already be doing some or all of this, in which case this session may be a reassuring checklist. But for others, um, hopefully um, there'll be more that you can get from this. So first, let's take a look at the scale of the issue. The statistics are eye-watering. Trade in counterfeit, pirated and copied goods was declared to be 3.3% of global trade in 2019, representing lost sales of nearly 464 billion US dollars. And these figures, by the way, come from the OECD and EU IPO. European statistics are even more concerning, with counterfeits and pirated goods accounting for 5.8% of imports to the EU at a value of 123 billion euros. So the relative impact of counterfeiting is twice as high for developed countries in the EU as it is for the world as a whole. Taxes go unpaid as a result of this, firms go out of business, and jobs are lost every year due to counterfeits. So I think it's plain to see that the statistics are grim and indications are that the problem beyond being vast and global is also growing. The majority of fake goods, around 83%, originate in mainland China and Hong Kong. That's perhaps no surprise. But there are other major points of origin, including the United Arab Emirates, Turkey, Singapore, Thailand, and India. An OECD report looked at economies where IP rights holders have their headquarters registered, and almost 24% of the total value of seized product refers to IP rights of holders registered in the United States. And that's quickly followed by France, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, and the UK, which amount to a further 50%. And then there are a growing number of businesses in Singapore, Hong Kong, Brazil, and sometimes people think surprisingly China. Um, and those are all territories that are becoming targets. So it's plain to see that fakes can and do affect brands from just about anywhere around the globe. Counterfeiters don't discriminate by territory, but neither do they discriminate when it comes to the products they copy or the way that they threaten a brand online. And the problem threatens just about every consumer sector, perhaps in different ways. Um, for every fake luxury handbag, there's a fake box of washing powder. For every dodgy outdoor jacket, there are countless counterfeit face creams, bottles of whiskey, fitness gear products, and electrical products, amongst many more. No sector is left untouched. And it's not just the products that are copied. Services, um, perhaps relating to booking a holiday or playing games online of different kinds or banking online, these are also areas that are affected increasingly. And where the products come from extends to so in our ever more online focused world, particularly since the pandemic, consumer shopping isn't restricted to local territory and product and services can be purchased from a multitude of channels, online marketplaces, social media channels, search engines, websites, domains, app stores and NFT markets, meaning that when the consumer parts with their money, the seller could be anywhere in the world. And counterfeiters make unsavoury bedfellows. Indeed, counterfeiting is often linked to other forms of organised criminal activity, whether it's poor working conditions for employees, to child labour, environmental pollution, human trafficking, modern slavery, drug trafficking, and even terrorism in some cases. Counterfeiting goes hand in hand with the types of activity that no brand wants to be associated with. And we can see how nimble the counterfeiters are. You wouldn't be able to move the volume of counterfeited goods around the world physically 
in cargo ships and so on, or virtually via fraudulent websites and domains and social media content, unless there was an organized operation facilitating it. And the increase in popularity of many brands is often quickly followed by an increase in the levels of brand threat and counterfeiting experienced. It's often assumed that counterfeiting is only the problem for big brands and historically luxury, but a quick check online instantly shows that the smaller companies are also being copied. Brands of all sizes, of all value, are under attack by copycats and they infiltrate the supply chain. But the good news is there is a solution for brands, large and small, whether threats be major or potentially minor. Um, and so there, there is definitely a solution and I will come on to that shortly. But before that, another quick question, are all the suspicious listings really offering counterfeit product? In short, for the most part, yes. It can sometimes be hard to ascertain if there is truly a counterfeit product behind the online listing, and that's where sometimes test purchasing can come in. But it is often the case that sellers are trying to ride behind the coat on the coattails of the successful brands by stealing their images, which is where we see copyright abuse or where the reputation of the brand name through trademark infringement um, comes in. And this is where folks sell similar or related product without actually manufacturing a branded counterfeit. And all these kind of infringements are still a threat to the brand. However, beyond trademark and copyright infringement, many illicit sellers are offering counterfeit goods, either made to order because um, they, they, they're waiting for the orders to come in or in sitting stock. And how do we know this? Because a brief look at consumer reviews reveal photos of direct counterfeits being unboxed and unwrapped in homes across the globe. The production and sale of counterfeits has serious ramifications for a business. And for those of you that are already experiencing this, you will see how they divert revenue, they damage brand reputation, and they put customers at risk. And as consumers experience quality problems with fake goods, the legitimate brand's customer service and warranty costs climb. So not only are they missing out on perhaps the original sale, but they're having to put more resource into pacifying angry consumers who've received something that they weren't expecting. And the competition for the fake cheaper options can put a downward pressure on the price of the legitimate goods. Developing a product and a reputation takes time and money and huge efforts. And counterfeiters are bypassing all of this hard work and making a profit on the back of it. And what's more, they produce products that lack the quality and the durability of genuine goods, and they risk putting the damage uh, and damaging the brand's reputation when sold to the unsuspecting consumer. And aside from the poor imitation and the disappointment that a consumer feels when they receive a poor imitation, counterfeit goods and inferior goods can be extremely dangerous in many different ways to the consumer. So low quality paints, glues, dyes, other components, ingredients can sometimes be toxic. Poor electrical wiring can lead to electric shocks or fires. And when products are relied on for safety, it can of course be fatal. And there are many cases where things have been brought very um, clearly by the media into specific situations where people have been killed as a result of a counterfeit good. So why do people buy fakes? 37% of fake goods are deemed to be dangerous to the health and safety of consumers. And someone once suggested that if an airplane had a 37% chance of crashing, would you board? I don't think I would. There are many reasons why consumers may buy a counterfeit online, and a lot of fakes are purchased unknowingly. However, the crux of the issue is for the most part, fakes are cheaper than the real products they imitate. And this perceived bargain will always be the number one draw towards counterfeits, be this for knowing or unknowing consumers. 
Fake goods are cheap for a reason. There are no design costs, labor practices are often unregulated, and technical development is often non-existent. With some brands, consumers may be prepared to buy a fake to gain the prestige of the brand name and design without paying the higher retail price. And whilst the fakes are often subpar in fit, quality and function, the perceived and for the most part real risk behind fakes does not serve as a deterrent for many, especially if there is no perceived high risk to safety. Think of t-shirts, for example, and other garments. Of course, many consumers want the real thing, and many brands have built loyal followings through sophisticated marketing campaigns and commitment to quality and superb customer service. But the issue remains, many consumers want the brand prestige, but aren't prepared to pay the brand's price. So what can be done about the problem? There are two lines of action. One is to prevent the issue getting out of hand in the first instance. And the second is to proactively defend against the attack on your brand. So taking the first of these in terms of prevention, there are three pillars. Make yourself a difficult target, educate your customers and secure your supply chain. Make yourself a difficult target. Firstly, prepare and secure your brand. Most vitally, register your intellectual property. And I assume you know a good IP lawyer or attorney, but if you don't, please do get in touch with the team afterwards. Trademarks, particularly word marks, that is the actual written term as opposed to logos and figures, allow you to enforce against copycats using your name with far greater ease. And the technology can really step in here. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And we find that when protecting brands with the registered word mark, as well as the logo mark, so a combined mark, that usually gives stronger rights, word and logo. Registering a trademark for your brand name and logo in all the relevant territories and the correct product classes offers the best return on investment. Um, we often say, think about where you're selling into, um, where you're manufacturing from, and start with those areas. Um, keep your trademarks up to date as your product portfolio and sales strategy develop. And we found that registering a trademark in China, even if you're not selling in China, is also worth discussing with your legal counsel. And you can expand on this too, to include securing social media handles and domain names. With domain names, carefully curating a portfolio of domains can be important for brand owners because it can help reduce cyber squatters and those wanting to register fraudulent clone websites. By registering social media handles, you can prevent fraudsters from passing themselves off as the real deal. Where pertinent, you may also wish to register unique designs and or patents to strengthen the protection against copycats, stealing your aesthetics and inventions without using your branding. It's very common also for counterfeiters to use um, your official images to make their listings appear real or of a higher quality than they really are. Copyright under the Berne Convention is a global unregistered intellectual property right, and it can be really useful in enforcing against the misuse of your images online. And in some cases, it can also be enforced against the theft of your designs to limit damage. Many consumers are duped by pictures of legitimate products when what is actually being shipped resembles nothing of the, the original product. And do remember also um, to keep a complete archive of marketing materials and images, including products no longer on the market. Secondly, educate your customers. Build brand loyalty through information and let your customers know that you are busy protecting them. As an aside, I'm proud to serve on the International Trademark Association, the INTA's Unreal campaign. It's an international committee of volunteers working hard to educate young consumers globally about the dangers of buying fake products and encouraging young people to buy real product. This could be a whole website a webinar in its, um, on its own, but do let me know afterwards if you have any questions or would like to know more. 
And some folks think that whilst revealing you have fakes to your customers might be a risk, I would disagree. I think it will strengthen your brand long term. So tell your customers where they can buy real product from, who your official distributors are, and vitally tell them where to avoid buying product from. This is a strategy many brands already adopt with dedicated pages on their website, highlighting how to avoid buying a counterfeit and telling them where, to, where their official retailers are. One poll revealed that over three quarters of consumers would be less likely to buy products from a brand if their reputation was associated with counterfeit goods. And if that's true, all of the above is, is probably a good idea. And in so doing, you can show your customers why a 50 euro, pound, dollar fake product is not better value than your 500 euro, dollar, pound one. Tell the story of your product, the hard work, skilled labor, the resulting salaries that goes into each one. At the end of the day, the online consumer clicks a button and expects your product. So tell them why the real product is worth it and tell them why the fake one isn't. Otherwise, they may not find out until they've made the purchase. Thirdly, secure your supply chain. Gather as much information as possible about your supplier. Visit your factory, if and when you can, and build and maintain this relationship. And it's probably telling my grandmother to suck eggs, but before discussing this matter pertaining to your intellectual property with anyone, be sure to sign a non-disclosure agreement or an NNN in China. A good relationship with your distributors is also essential here too. And many brands that we work with are tipped off by their distributors regarding counterfeits. Of course, it is also in their interest to remove these goods from sale. Once your product is on the move, register trademarks with customs agencies in the different territories that you distribute your product to. It might seem like a chore, but it is worth it. Customs and border control around the world can be a vital partner in stopping illicit imports. And if you need assistance with this, again, please ask, we can help. Include secret features that distinguish your products from knockoffs. You can put secret tells in your product. Some folks use microscopic dots and stamp codes on packaging. Some products use RFID systems or radio frequency identification, and others use hologram stickers. However, solutions don't need to be cutting edge. It can be something as simple as sewing a particular color thread into a fabric. In terms of proactively defending against online attack of your brand, find out whether and where you have a problem. We can help you define a successful online brand protection strategy with clear KPIs not just to remove the highest volume of listings all over the internet, but to target your listings that are most damaging to your brand and where they affect your sales and your profits the most. Our goal is to make it as easy as possible for the consumer to find genuine product and as hard as possible to come across illicit product. Our software, trained to behave like a consumer, can target pages sought by your customers and keep these pages clean. And that can be a good KPI and a good measure. So think about where you're likely to be most affected by fakes and copies and where, through your intellectual property rights acting as weaponry in your defense, you're most likely to be effective. For some brands, the issue is so extensive that it's important to set these priorities. The most profitable and highly targeted product lines, the biggest offenders offering the greatest number of counterfeit goods in the most highly trafficked territories and on the most highly trafficked channels. Identifying these and going after these is the best way to go. And this is where the, the software can come in. And our proactive approach has four parts, monitoring, detection, enforcement and intelligence gathering. So the first pillar, the monitoring, we monitor across hundreds of online marketplaces, key social media sites, 
global search engine results, registered domain names, app stores, and NFT markets. So all of those things that you entered at the beginning in the poll questions, all of these can be covered. Our web scraper uses keywords. They can be around trademarks, misspellings of your trademark. They can be in different languages um, and scripts, Arabic, Mandarin, Cantonese, Russian, Korean. Um, and we can also use descriptive terms as well beyond the trademark. Um, and we can also use images too. And all of this returns relevant results in, into the database. And it, it targets the products, it targets the content, and it targets the intellectual property rights that you want to protect most. And if there are results from sites that are not yet supported by our software, these can also be identified and imported by our team using a bespoke browser extension. So we can go wherever we need to go to protect your brand in the best way. Through the monitoring, we can identify established issues as well as new trends. And it is really important, as I said at the beginning, that we try and keep up with, if not stay ahead of the bad actors. So if you are already monitoring the marketplaces, for example, you may need to broaden your search. And in that way, you could then start to spot fake domains and websites or app stores. Or it might be that there's an increased use of social media for selling counterfeits and for simple financial fraud, for example, where there's no product sold. Or maybe it's about a use of phishing for corporate counterfeiting and invoice fraud, which we see increasingly. And then, of course, there might be impersonation of individuals or brands. So the brand threats are constantly changing and it's really important to, to keep a proactive eye on that. As an aside, some brands also use the data from the monitoring process to identify the use of their branding when undergoing a brand consolidation process. Um, and this has been particularly useful where, where brands have been brought up, bought up um, and merged and, and there's a cleanup operation going online. Others monitor genuine sellers to check for compliance of branding to make sure those genuine sellers are using the latest images, are sticking to um, the recommended retail price that's advised, um, and that are describing the products in, in the right way to ensure that compliance is consistent. So there's lots of ways that the monitoring can be used. In addition, some brands have a completely different objective, and that's in response to the decreased revenue that some brands are experiencing they are now taking e-commerce in-house and building exclusivity through limited runs and collaborations and a selective retail network. And this can have a positive impact, not only on growing sales, but on fighting fakes too. So it will give them a firmer control of online selling and it will make it far easier to understand and monitor the distribution network. And consumers expect to pay more, perhaps, for a bespoke and exclusive retail experience. And less and less, hopefully, in that case of the target market, will have interest in scrolling through dropshipping companies selling replicas. So that's the first prong, the first pillar, monitoring. And it's all about bringing results into the system. From there, we enter the detection phase, and this is where the AI in the form of augmented intelligence using the human brain to train the system rather than artificial intelligence ensures there's an efficiency in the gathering and categorization of listings. Through a process of this machine learning, the AI assigns appropriate relevancy scores to agreed metrics so that only relevant listings are categorized and the machine learning assists a process of categorization with the system being trained for each brand every week, making daily efficiency improvements um, in the relevancy of detection. Some examples of that detection might be around keyword. As I said at the beginning, keywords relating to trademark, for example, or product description. So this detects the use of trademarks and brand names in the listing or in the content on the web pages or the social media content text. Spelling variations can be used and different languages can be applied as well. Then there's text pattern, which detects the use of similar product descriptions, contextual word use, and that's useful for reducing irrelevant listings, but also for detecting design right abuse. 
And then there's image similarity, which detects the use of similar or identical images useful for copyright production protection, where um, people are not using the trademark necessarily in the product description. And as well as copyright, it can also help to detect design abuse and patent abuse. Then there's logo detection, which detects the use of logos in images. And that's perfect for identi and identifying the figurative trademark abuse that, that might be in the image, but not anywhere on the listing. And then there's also trademark, uh, sorry, text in image, which is where um, we can detect the use of keywords in images, which is perfect for identifying the trademark infringement where there is no use of the word mark in the listing text. So the detection is quite sophisticated and it employs both the use of words, the use of logo and the use of images. That's the detection. At the end of that, listings will be beautifully categorized and relevant, um, but nothing happens without the brand's authorization when it comes to enforcement. So enforcement can be initiated via the portal and to save you time via a pre-authorized criteria. And this maximizes the speed at which infringing content can be actioned and listings and sellers can subsequently be taken offline. So in, during the enforcement service, we want to um, use um, registered and unregistered intellectual property. And this will be to remove listings and sellers um, from different channels, to request the removal of um, infringing content, to remove whole sites from live access online, and that's reporting to web hosts and registrants and TLD managers. And where web hosts and registrars are unresponsive, and for those of you that have got issues with um, fraudulent websites, you will probably have experienced this. There are other effective steps that can be taken to disrupt the bad actors behind the fraudulent websites. And that is to report the offenders to payment service providers such as Visa and PayPal, and they will disable the payment options to those known to sell the counterfeit products. So that's one measure that can be taken beyond reporting to the hosts and the registrars. Additionally, major search engines such as Google offer similar facilities and they can de-index websites and they have procedures for requesting the removal of ads linked to counterfeit sites. And whilst that may mean that the website in its, itself isn't removed, it will mean that the consumer by searching on those channels won't find that that website. And there's also a further step which can be to involve reporting websites to enforcement agents. PIPCU in the UK, the Police Intellectual Property Crime Unit is one example of those. To avoid the whack-a-mole effect, we will always seek to maximise online action against key offenders. And wherever appropriate and possible, we will remove the seller as well as the illicit listings from the platform. Our team works extremely hard to be an extension to your team to ensure that any enforcement with which we are charged joins up with your wider business strategy and feed all intelligence back to you so that you can take further action as needed. It is also worth um, mentioning at this stage that there is a word of caution. Be very careful about what you accuse people of doing. Take legal advice with regards to writing a cease and desist template. Again, this is where the Abbey and team can step in and be very aware of the dangers of groundless threats. Because if you wrongly accuse someone where there is no infringement or the right is invalid in some way, a person aggrieved by it can take action against you. So worth remembering that. The 